personally very excited about the next talk. Uh, our speaker is a great communicator and a bit of a celebrity uh, on social media and mainstream media such as BBC, C CNN, The Guardian, uh, and a bunch of other ones. Uh, she somehow managed to grab the domain fields aihub.org and robohub.org, uh, which are nonprofit websites to connect uh, communities in the field. Uh, she worked in cancer research at MIT, received her PhD from EPFL, and is currently a professor of swarm engineering at the University of Bristol. Uh, professor Sabine Howard she will be talking about swarms for people. Uh, the stage is yours, Professor. Thank you very much for the invitation, and it's been very fun to, to see the previous talks as well, a lot of amazing research. Today I wanted to bring you on a journey um, through swarms across scales, from nanoparticles for cancer treatment to larger robots that I think could be useful for logistics. And really it's not just about making the swarms, but it's also figuring out how we can get these swarms out of the lab to people so that they start having an impact in the real world. Um, as, as many swarm engineers, my source of inspiration is this flock of birds. Uh, if you look at these birds, they can do beautiful dances in the sky. And there's many features that are interesting for engineering. For example, if you keep adding birds to the flock, the flock continues to fly so they can scale to large numbers. If a bird falls to the ground, the whole flock doesn't crash. Uh, and so they're robust to individual failure and together they can do more than the sum of their parts. So they're better, for example, as a collective at avoiding predators. And what's fascinating is that these beautiful dances are not the result of a plan. They're not result of a leader telling every bird what to do, but they're the result of each one of these birds reacting to their local environment, following perhaps a simple set of rules. We don't exactly know how the birds function. Uh, and that gives rise to these emergent, um, these emergent dances. And these idea, this idea of self-organization, you see it really everywhere around you, whether you're looking at birds flocking or at ants as they create trails to your picnic table or bees as they make decisions about their next nest site, or indeed our ability to grow fully functioning human beings just uh, from a couple of cells. So as a swarm engineer, the main challenge that we face is that we're often um, interested in achieving a group behavior, for example, flocking, trail formation, decision-making, um, morphogenesis, that idea of creating shapes. Uh, but we don't have the rules, those rules that drive the individuals that give rise to those desired swarm behaviors. And that's really the thing that we need to crack as swarm engineers. So the way we do this in my team is through two different approaches. One is to use bioinspiration. When biologists have studied a system and have come up with interesting rules, we take inspiration from those and then put them on our artificial systems. But in many instances, we don't have a bioinspiration other than the swarm concept. Uh, and in those cases, we need to discover the rules through, typically through exploration. Exploration could be us guessing the rules. So using a simulator, guessing the rules, seeing what emerges as a swarm behavior. It could be lots of people guessing rules, which is essentially crowdsourcing, or it could be using machine learning to automatically uh, design the rules that give us a desired collective behavior. So if you use bioinspiration, the nice thing is that you can go and test this in reality. So here you see a swarm of 10 robots. I'm behind the camera. This is in Dario Floriano's lab at EPFL, and we put flocking algorithms on these robots. So these are their GPS trajectories, and they, they follow the simple flocking rules. So they attract to their neighbors, they repulse from their neighbors, and they try to align from their neighbors. Uh, these are Craig Reynolds rules, and you get these flocking circles that emerge as a result of that. So bioinspiration, if you're lucky, you can test it in reality, and it works. Now, now those robots were fun, uh, but there were 10 of them, and in my mind, swarms needed to be much bigger. And so I spent three years at MIT in the laboratory of Sangeeta Bhatia, and her expertise, uh, or one of them, is in designing nanoparticles. And these nanoparticles, because of their size, uh, nanometer size, were quite interesting or useful as vehicles to deliver drugs to tumors, because they're quite good at going through the bloodstream, leaking out from the bloodstream through the holes that are present in certain types of tumors in these, in these vessels, 
into the tumor and being retained there. So they were useful vehicles for the delivery of drugs or diagnostics. And what interested me with these, these particles is that they worked in the 10 to the power 13. So very large number to, to wrap your head around if you're thinking of swarms. And these particles came in different sizes. She could engineer them and her team with different shapes. This might be a little iron oxide nanoworm there. You could change the charge of the particle. You could change um, the material. Some of them were energy receptive, so you could use light or magnetic fields to activate them. You could decorate these particles with molecules that allow you to interact, for example, with other molecules on the surface of cancer cells. And you could load them with a cargo to release a drug in a tumor environment. And so really, if you, you take a step back, you realize that there's many designs on these particles and how you design them in terms of their size, their shape, their charge, their coating, their material changes how they behave in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the tumor, in, the, in, the, in a human scenario. So the question is, how do you change the design of these robots so that you get a desired collective behavior? So, you know, in the robot world, we program them. In the particle world, we design the body of these particles so that they do something that we want. So here's just an example, a simple example to wrap your head around it. It took us a bit of time to crack this, actually. So here we're just changing two, two elements on the particle. One is its size, and that changes how fast it moves. And the other is how sticky this particle is. And so if particles leak out from this vessel here, our goal is to kill all the cancer cells and they stick to the cancer cells and get eaten up. That's how they kill those cancer cells. So just those two nodes, just the size and the stickiness entirely changes where they distribute in a tumor tissue. So if our goal is to kill 20 cells deep, that would be dark red here, depending on how sticky it is and how fast it is, most of these particles wouldn't kill 20 cells. Some of them would only kill one or two cells deep and some of them would kill much further. <clears throat> and I think just seeing that two different design changes completely change the collective dynamics of these particles was something quite useful for the bioengineering community. And if you're wondering where the robots are, I will come back to it, I promise. Um, but we've since then designed more realistic models of these nanoparticles. So here what you're looking at is a simulation of particles as they stick to the surface of these tumor tissues. And at the bottom, you're looking at real nanoparticles in our lab in a little tumor on a chip. Uh, uh, the particles are blue here or green. And here what you see is a little artificial tumor tissue, uh, which is uh, embedded with these little red particles, which are we're using as proxies for cells. So we have ways now to model how these particles move through tumors in a more realistic way and to validate them using microfluidics or little tumors on a chip. And this is part of a bigger effort now to do this automatically, where ideally someone would come with a clinical challenge, a certain type of tumor that they need to treat, and we would use machine learning to automatically discover the right particle for that specific tumor scenario, push that to reality through synthesis, making the particles, test them in vivo with our collaborators. And this is part of a big European project called Evo Nano, um, if you're interested in looking into it. And we've released the first baseline code for, for this that does, does sort of the full circle where you define a scenario, you grow a virtual tumor, you chop out little tumor tissues from this virtual tumor, and then you treat them uh, basically using artificial evolution or machine learning, if you want to think of it that way, to automatically design the right particle for these tumors. So that's you know, that's sort of just a, an inkling for how things work at the nanoscale, but really we were interested in more swarmy behaviors. And, and so we started thinking about how we could create more complex scenarios. And we created a game called NanoDoc that allowed us to crowdsource the design of these scenarios and of their treatments. So the things that our, our players learned were that you had tumor cells and you had to put a certain dose to treatment. You had healthy cells. We needed healthy cells because otherwise the solution is always to dump loads of drugs. So we needed to be a bit more specific. You could uh, dose different particles in there. You could combine particles. You could change their size, which changes their speed. Some of these cells have a coating or receptors and particles could stick to those receptors. Your particles could be loaded with a drug and you can make them smart in the sense that if they received something from the environment, they could release their cargo. So now we have a reactive agent and they can also self-assemble and disassemble. So actually this idea of going left or right, like I had in my flying robots before, we don't have that with particles that are so tiny. They just move through random walks usually. 
And so instead you can speed them up and slow them down by dynamically changing their side. So actually as a swarm engineer, you start thinking, well, our particles can sense their environment. They can act on their environment by releasing something. That thing that they release can be detected by another particle. So now we have communication and you can control their motion by dynamically changing their size. Um, and so this is just to give you a teaser of what these types of simulations look like. Um, and have been using it to discover. That's my voice in a recorded fashion, but you can sort of see them moving through these virtual tumors and the players design lots of particles and they learned many skills about nanomedicine along the way. Um, we actually had 100, around 180,000 simulations, so they did a good job helping us out. But we also spent time playing this game to see if we could make nanosystems do things that we saw in the more swarmy world. So here what you see is a trail that goes from the upper left corner to the bottom right corner using these nanoparticle dynamics. And this is a little bit inspired from the way the ants create trails as they go to your picnic table. Actually, we started from the same set of rules and we're gonna to come to that later, but it uses this notion that particles can interact with each other to do a behavior that's a little bit more interesting. So the trouble that we had at the nanoscale was that um, they're hard to engineer in the way we want them to be. Uh, you, would need, you would need a chemist to design the particle that has the right dynamics to do the behavior that you want. And so what we wanted to design to help us in that process was, was a, a new playground, a little, a little micro playground that allows us to control nano and micro swarms. So we built this device called the Dome for Dynamic Optical Microenvironment. And essentially what it is, it's a projector. So we can project thousands of pixels with little micro mirrors. Uh, in three different wavelengths, but you could change the LED and change what you project. And then here on our sample, we have our micro swarm, um, and we have a camera that looks at what's happening based on, on this illumination and can change the illumination pattern. So what this allows us to do is to augment micro agents using light. So we can both control them using light, or we can pretend that they're communicating, or we can deposit information in the environment. And this allows us to think about how we would design swarms at the micro or at the nano scale. Um, this platform is entirely open. It's just been published on BioArchive. Uh, all off-the-shelf components are 3D printed. It's taken Anna, her whole PhD, to sort of build it in a state that she can share it um, in this way. And, and it allows, it's also pretty low cost. So if, if you're interested in, in doing this, it's below $1,000. Uh, and that's quite a, a fun little playground. But here's just an example of her um, illuminating using her system Volbox, which are little algae, which are several hundred microns. Um, and here we're pretending these uh, Volvox can communicate. So you can see we're tracking them. These are real Volvox. We're illuminating the area around them. Let's pretend that they could communicate. If we could engineer them, we'd make them release chemicals, right? Or heat or something. Uh, but here we're using this as a stepping stone. And what you're seeing is this communication propagates through the swarm of Volvox. You see when they enter the communication range of their neighbors, they propagate that signal and you can see it's closed loop because we're doing the tracking and the constant updating as we go. So communication is a useful building block for swarms. Here's another one, stigmergy, which is what the ants use. They basically deposit chemicals in the environment to create their trails. But here our Volvox are depositing light in the environment. And actually you can see they react with, to the light as well. So you can see this Volvox just stopped when it crossed that trajectory and we can control their motion. So here you're seeing us basically stop them based on illumination. So that's something uh, where we now have a playground where we can start to think about how you combine communication and stigmergy and motion to do uh, things that are useful at the level of a collective of microsystems. So uh, this is our new playground and we're currently looking for ways in which to use it. We're excited about biomedical applications in general because they work in huge numbers and the agents are relatively, relatively simple. I think biologists won't, wouldn't say that their, their entities are simple. Um, but can we use this to treat cancer or understand the dynamics of cancer cell populations? Can we use this to treat bacterial biofilms and do something in the space of antimicrobial resistance? Can we use this to create new and exciting materials or structures at the micro and the nanoscale that might be functional or, or be useful in different ways? So that deep dive into the nano and the micro world has a purpose. One, it, all of this is bio-inspired profoundly, but also it's, I think it changes the way we think about robots. So if you think about robots at a macro scale and you were to design a robot um, 
that that was designed it's it's meant to plant seeds in a field okay it's meant to plant seeds in a field the way you would do that typically is to zigzag through that farm field and plant your seeds in a, in a se sequential way sort of right but that's not how you would treat a tumor right we, you, you wouldn't create a little micro robot that just zaps all these little cancer cells one after the other because it doesn't scale so what if you could design a swarm of little robot seeds instead that basically self-deploy over this area. You might have hundreds of thousands of them um, and basically plant themselves and biodegrade. That little bubble would contain the nutrients that they have uh, and they could follow a very simple set of rules in order to do that. So it, it changes a little bit the way you think about that. And this idea of using simple behaviors on robots is not uh, completely nuts. Uh, so here what you see is little kilobots. So they're coin-sized robots. Uh, we have a thousand of them at the lab. They were originally de designed by Radhika Nagpal's lab over at Harvard. Um, and these robots are, they're capable of, of left, right, straight motion, but actually they're very noisy. And so very often we use random walks and that's what you're seeing here. They can communicate with their neighbors within 10 centimeters. <clears throat> they, um, they have a sensor so they can detect the light, the light levels. And that's pretty much all we're using in this context here. We're not even using the light actually. So if you remember those trails I showed you in the nanoparticle simulator, this is the same set of rules. So here we're releasing robots. There's a hundred of them. These are real robots, they're not simulations. We're looking for this element in the environment. When they find that element, they stop, they broadcast that they've stopped and you see these trails uh, form quite readily. Uh, for those who, who might have a more of a physics-y background, this is a form of diffusion-limited aggregation, except we prune the trees so it doesn't just grow like a snowflake, uh, which is what, what that algorithm would look like. Um, but that's one example where random walks, just local interactions, you could implement this in theory at the micro and the nanoscale, give you the ability to find something in the environment. And actually, if you have two things, it finds the nearest one. If you put an obstacle in the way, it goes around the obstacles. You get a lot of things for free um, just using these simple rules. I'm leaving the sound. That's the actual sound of the robots. So there's 400 of these little robots um, here doing decisions. So here they're exchanging between red and blue, uh, inspired from a honeybee algorithm. Uh, blue is the right decision. So you'd expect them. You see there they've converged to blue more or less. And here we're again, random, random walks, very simple local exchanges. And at the level of the swarm, we quite reliably converge to blue. Uh, we actually uh, inject noise. So those green robots are robots that are, that are noisy and might be skewing the system if, if not treated properly in terms of how we design our algorithms. Uh, and this is with 400 robots. And here what you're seeing is a form of morphogenesis. So again, very simple exchanges. Actually, we're using a form of virtual chemical exchanges called morphogens. The cool thing with this is that they can grow little structures, little lymph structures. And this is with biologists, uh, James Sharp and, and his colleagues who study morphogenesis. And let me just play this one more time. What's happening here is every robot is exchanging little chemicals. And as a result, you get these spots which are Turing spots. We're using rules inspired from Alan Turing's understanding. And these spots emerge entirely uh, in a self-organized way, just, just like you would see spots or stripes on animals. And those stripes are what drive the growth of the robots. So here you see the spots, these limbs start to emerge. And because it's self-organized, you can chop the limbs and the, and the limbs regrow, or you could split the swarm and the swarm self heals. So again, this notion that we have very, very simple motion and local interactions that give rise to cool um, and resilient uh, collective behaviors. And this is with 350 of the real uh, kilobots that we have in the lab. And then if we go towards this idea of, of you know, huge numbers of robots, uh, we'll need to find a way to make them maybe single use, maybe biodegradable, uh, maybe they'll need to move in slightly different ways. So this is just a two, two jumper, but we have a five jumper now. And we've done some math to see that if you'd produce enough of these five jumpers that are coated, for example, with a little a sensory paint that senses a chemical or something in the environment, you could very quickly sort of navigate over an environment and sense that environment. Um, and you might see that little splash. That's because these robots are activated through water. Um, so the water basically releases the latches and that's what allows them to jump, which would be useful. Um, if it could be powered by rain. Okay, so, so then 
this bio inspiration, you know, gives us a lot of cool and exciting ideas. It allows us to think across scales from the micro world to the robotic world. But there's many more hardcore engineering problems where we just don't have that bio inspiration available. And so we need to explore what rules, um, what rules make most sense. And so in those contexts, what we use very often is, is artificial evolution. Um, so it's, it's uh, the way to think about it is inspired from natural evolution. We start with random programs, which are encoded through a form of virtual DNA. And these random programs, we check how good they are. And then if they're good, then they reproduce and they mix and they mutate and they go on to a next generation. And so generation after generation in the virtual world, we're getting better and better and better programs that we can test on the swarm. Okay, so what you're seeing here is a swarm of robots designed by Simon Jones uh, and Matthew Studley and Alan Winfield um, with us. And these robots are quite useful because they have GPUs on board. So we saw in the previous talk that the processing power we have on board these systems is increasing. And we wanted to make use of that so that we could stop relying on external computers to, to find our controllers, basically. The idea that the swarm would be autonomous is that it would you'd put it in the wild and it would learn how to swarm on the go. So here what you're seeing is, is these robots um, called x -Pucks, but the swarm's called a teraflop swarm because it has much more computation than usual. And they're running little evolutionary models to learn how to push this Frisbee to one side of the arena. And it takes them 15 minutes to come up with a good strategy. You can see it here. Their strategy at the end is to kind of have two of them come together and wiggle around that, that Frisbee. So that's the start, not very good. And over 15 minutes, they, they figure it out. Um, for those who, are, are, who know about evolutionary models, each one of these robots is running evolution and it's an island model so they can share their controllers with other robots as they go along. So um, this is useful because it allows us to set a problem. For example, please push the Frisbee to one side of the arena and the robots uh, come up with the controller for that. And it's, it's a useful way to come up with creative solutions. And sometimes after evolution has happened, we take inspiration from those and then hand code them in our solutions. Uh, but I like this idea that you could put them in the wild and they should come up with something useful. Um, historically, a lot of what we devolved were, was neural networks um, because it, it gave us flexibility. Um, but increasingly what we're evolving is behavior trees. So in the behavior that you just saw before, the controller that we're evolving for the robot is a tree, uh, which was used very, very much in the gaming industry to design behaviors for characters in, in games. And so um, the reason I like these trees is we can read them as opposed to a neural network. And so that allows us to make sense of what's happening uh, on the swarm, or at least at the individual level. There's always that you know, emergence that's not, not always so obvious, but at the individual level, it allows us to understand what's happening. So you can, for example, look at this tree and you would read it, um, you know, basically going left to right. And, and I won't go into the details here, but you can read the paper if you wanna learn a little bit more how to design them, but you could look at different behaviors and color code what your robot is doing. So you can create little debuggers using these behavior trees that makes it a little bit more um, intuitive. All right, so these behavior trees, we're also using them in a different way. So here, what you saw was us evolving a controller for the robot. So each one of these robots was running this tree or a different tree if they happen to evolve something different uh, in that scenario. Uh, we thought that for the real world, it might be really useful to also be able to evolve a supervisor. So a supervisor would be someone in, that's interacting with the swarm, someone or computer system that's interacting with the swarm that could give them high level swarm information. For example, they could say, hey swarm, go north, or hey swarm, maybe now you should disperse, or hey swarm, please start spiraling, or do, do something along those lines. Um, so these are not controlling individuals, uh, because that doesn't scale in terms of the numbers, it's, it's controlling the swarm behavior and providing some additional input, which makes sense if the supervisor has more information, which often is the case in real world deployments. So here, what we're trying to find is the supervisory control. So you can see this is what the supervisor says. It says disperse, and then it's going to say um, north, go northeast. 
And you can see these robots space out because there's still some local forces between them. So they are interacting locally. And that allows us to, to automatically discover ways in which we can efficiently uh, navigate different environments using these swarm behaviors as a building block. It does some interesting things like it splits the swarm on corners. So it comes up with some strategies that we wouldn't have necessarily thought of. And we've also been working on that for more complex environments. So this is um, the map of the Bristol Robotics Lab. So it's quite a complex environment to, to tackle. Here you can see what the behavior tree is doing. So it's going east, it's dispersing. Um, here, the center of mass and the spread is the only information available to the supervisor because we're assuming the supervisor can't keep track of what every robot is doing. So it gets this bulk information as an input. And you can see that it does a pretty good job of, of navigating this environment. And if you're interested in this, there should be a video up soon uh, for DARS thinking about how we, um, what happens when we close these doors and there's uncertainty. So Elliot locked a bunch of doors and found strategies that generalize better even in these realistic um, environments. So I feel like we're at a point in swarming where we, um, we've been thinking about algorithms for a while. We have two different ways or many different ways of doing this, but we, we have ways of discovering rules for different uh, scenarios that we care about. We can design better and better hardware with more computation or in numbers. So we have both the capabilities in numbers and the capabilities in terms of what the individual robots can do that are increasing. Um, and so it feels like the moment is right to make these, these systems a reality outside, outside of the lab. Um, and so we've started to shift gears to think about that a little bit. And I think a big part of that has to do with asking what people want uh, from swarms. So Danny designed an escape room, which sounds really weird in this COVID times because we did lock people in a room, um, but it was, it was a, basically these little tents, but there were a bunch of puzzles that taught them about swarming and they had to break out of the escape room like, like most escape rooms. Um, and they learned all about swarming as they went, went along. And at the end of it, we also asked them uh, what they thought swarms could be useful for and what the risks for society were versus the benefits for society. And so this is just a cute, cute map of things that people came up with. So we saw the example of the little Wally -E robots before collecting, collecting trash. I think there's a lot of that being basically very helpful for society in terms of collecting plastics, cleaning the ocean, clearing mines, um, nuclear decommissioning, construction, search and rescue surgery monitoring the weather, pollinating, maybe for those who have seen um, Black Mirror, um, public opinion manipulation, uh, not so beneficial for society. So, so I think it's really useful to just have this mind map as, we, as we're considering different applications. Um, we also do a lot of communication in general. So it was mentioned, I run um, with a lot of others, RoboHub and AI Hub, which are two charities to connect the robotics and AI communities to the to the public. So we do a lot to try to communicate about this technology. And increasingly, a lot of our, at least my, my PhD projects start with a user study where they talk to people who might use these swarms so that we understand what the issues are. So we've we've spoken to firefighters uh, and this this has been expanded. Now we've spoken to people who use who work in warehouses, uh, who do bridge inspection. And, and that's helping us understand what matters. I think we, we keep thinking swarms are sci-fi, but when you go talk to someone about their food bank and you say, would you use a swarm in your food bank? They don't think sci-fi, they think actually swarms would be useful because we, we need help because we, you know, we, our food is expiring in the food bank and we can't keep track of what's happening and it's all very manual. And so the general feeling from these discussions was that they were interested in solutions to help them because a lot of these things aren't automated and they're done by people who would rather spend their time doing something else in, in the context in which we spoke to, to, to those people. Um, but there's always a caveat. They always say, but we want to make sure it works or but we want to make sure um, that it's you know, not going to, uh, there was a case of a museum, you know, lose all the pieces in the museum because we won't be able to find them, there's so many. Um, or we want to make sure that the swarm doesn't go in our path if we're firefighters and we don't want to be tripping over them. So there was always 
this, yes, it has potential. Yes, we need help in these little tasks that we're already doing, but could really use some help in, um, but we need to do it right. And I think it's understanding what the doing it right means. Uh, that's gonna be helpful if, if we deploy uh, these solutions in, in reality. So part of it is, is making the swarm not a black box anymore. So, so I think part of it has to do with making swarms, first of all, easy to interact with so that we can give those commands, the supervisory commands to the swarm, but also being able to read out of the swarm what it is the swarm is doing. So it doesn't just look like a mass that's going through, through your arena uh, or through your, through your building, through your, through your lab. Um, so this is work by Marihan. She's been thinking about how we make swarms expressive so in, in, in her world, making swarms expressive is making them create visual shapes that are understandable. So here, for example, you, you can see lines and circles. It's more to show that with few robots, we can create and define shapes um, quite readily. But then all of a sudden you get shapes that look a little bit more expressive. So here you have a winking eye, letters, emojis. You could sort of think quite outside of the box about how a swarm might relay their information back to the user. And we've, we've sort of updated our robots because the kilobots were not really doing what we needed to this latest robot called a tile. Um, we're building, uh, we're in the final phases of building a hundred of these. And our hope is that these tiles are more interactive. And actually this is funded by Nesta, um, which is, which, and, and the aim is to put these. So we're running human studies in the next, um, next month, uh, which we managed to do it with COVID as well. It's very interesting to do ethics in COVID. It's very challenging. Um, but these robots, what they do is they help humans make decisions. So essentially you have a crowd of humans who are socially distanced. You have these robots that are navigating between them and you have an important question to discuss. For example, you might want to ask, uh, should we be opening schools in the context of COVID? And then these robots uh, allow you to record your opinion. And, and what we're interested in, in finding out is do users feel empowered to input their opinion on a robot as opposed to talking, maybe if they're a bit shy? Do they feel like their opinion travels because there's that physical presence? Could that opinion now mingle with other people or other robots? And could it introduce people or groups or think differently? So we're using this as a playground to think not, not, not just about how to make the swarm expressive, but how it can make humans express um, with each other as well. And the more artistic side is if you have a hundred tiles side by side, they do create mosaics. Um, and so we're also thinking about what we can do that's just pretty and really exciting. Um, in the real world side, we're also looking at um, how we can design uh, in collaboration with wind racers and distributed avionics that have a large drone, uh, which is called the Ultra here, that has a hundred kilo cap um, capacity and thousand kilometer range. Um, to look at challenges like aid delivery and firefighting. And, and these are applications where drones and swarms of them shine um, because they're, they're challenges at a scale where you just need more than one thing to work together. Um, and so we're currently, we're working on the swarm algorithms. They have the drone capabilities. And we're also really thinking about how we twin these, these two worlds. So how can we get real-term feedback from the deployments? And the talks that I've seen at this conference have been extremely relevant but how can we get real-term feedback from these deployments so that we can actively change our swarm algorithms on the go, maybe using automatic optimization like I described before, maybe using hand input like a supervisor, but this, this really real-time pairing and a constant update of what you do based on a good understanding of what's happening in the world um, is something that we've only started to explore. So this grant is just starting. So this is, um, it's, it's a video of what we hope to come, not of what has been done uh, already. And, and this is the other one in the real world that we've also just started, uh, which has to do with looking at these really cool structures and basking charts. So we're, we're gonna be designing little robots um, that go around these basking charts and release little artificial plankton so that we can monitor how they get processed through, um, through the structures in the shark's mouth, which could be really useful for architecture and stuff like that. We have architects on the project. Um, this is a human frontier science project. Um, but there again, kind of thinking about how we get some of these robots into reality. And this one I think rings, rings true uh, with respect to some of the things that were said before. Um, the, the question I get often is, is why do swarms make sense um, in these real world contexts, right? Why wouldn't you you know, Amazon does it, or Ocado uses robots in their warehouses and they use many of them. 
And I think there's a key difference in, in what we're trying to do. Um, this is work with Toshiba. And what we've been thinking is that in the case of Amazon and Okada, they're really exciting technologies, really good warehouse solutions with many, many robots. Um, but they've been built through years of R&D and bespoke infrastructure. So there's that infrastructure that fits the robots. Um, and I think there's many, uh, many areas of unmet need, like small retail, you know, the back of a shoe shop. Um, it could be you have a pop-up warehouse. If you think of COVID, we've had to reorganize everything. So you might have a pop-up food bank or a distribution center for face masks uh, or, or a refugee camp. Um, you might have manufacturing, which is much more personalized in the future. And so you'll need to reconfigure your space and what it does and on a constant basis. And I think in those contexts, you're, you don't just care about performance. Um, you don't just care about performance, right? These are the, lo the typical logistics indicators. You want storage speed. Um, you want to know what's happening in your warehouse at all time. That's usually what you want. But in these contexts, I think maybe what you want is the ability to do no training, to not have infrastructure, um, to not have to worry if your agents are faring, to are, are, are failing, to not worry about the setup time and have something that's much more out of, out of the box. So that's, that's the aim. We have to see if we get there, but the aim is can we create swarms as an out of the box um, solution? And so for this, we've created these, these robots over the past two years with Toshiba called DOTS for Distributed Organization and Transport Solutions. You can see them move around here without their casing in the lifting platform. Uh, we now have 20 of these little robots. They're much faster. They have GPUs. They have the high specs that we were looking for in some of our swarm solutions before. And we're working, sorry, this video is not playing, but it's a little warehouse simulation showing how some of our behaviors work. Um, the key thing for us is that we're not, we're trying to take out the need for a lot of, um, you know, we don't do slam, we don't give them a map. We're really trying to see, figure out how we can make robots react to their local environment and still do the job of organizing, organizing a warehouse. We'll be announcing a competition with this test bed in the, in the coming weeks um, because it's fully accessible remotely um, and you can download the code and have a go at it. So we're really keen on, on people having a play at it and, and, and joining the competition in a couple of weeks. Um, and so, yeah, as I said, I think this has to do with, with how can we solve some of the tax, tasks that we usually solve with maps and extra intelligence and all of that. And so um, here's just a thought experiment. I think I have a little bit of time to walk through this scenario just to try and make my point. Um, if you were, it's, it's just an example. If you were to design a cloakroom, a pop-up cloakroom, okay, in a world where there's large events, um, and you, you want to hire a company that designs robots for that automatic cloakroom. Well, in, in, in the way people think of setting it up very often, they would assume you would install a central computer for this setup. Um, you would know where, what your warehouse looks like. So you would have a map of the area where this cloakroom should happen. Um, when the user comes, they would put their, they would connect with the central computer. They'd probably touch some buttons. And then that central computer would, would recruit a robot to come and pick up the jacket. And that central computer would tell the robots where to go and deposit that jacket in the cloakroom. And they would plan that trajectory for the robots so that they don't interact with the other robots or collide with them. And that central computer would know where that jacket is. So I think that's, that's often the way we set things up. Um, if it's completely distributed, the, the way this cloak group would work is that you would put a little marker on the floor for the retrieval area and a little marker on the floor for the deposit area. And you would have to put more intelligence in the objects um, so that they can locally understand each other. But really what the user would do is with their Bluetooth app, they'd download the cloakroom app and they'd say, okay, well, I'm gonna put, uh, I have a jacket, come, come and get me. And a robot that's nearby would sense that request and come and pick up the jacket and would just move around that cloakroom um, randomly maybe even and stop at some point in that cloakroom and deposit the box there. So that cloakroom might look entirely messy. It might look like a spiral. It might look like a honeycomb. It might look completely crazy for a human who would plan a, a cloakroom, but it doesn't matter because when the user comes back to retrieve the jacket, they have their little Bluetooth app and they say, well, I need jacket 3.2. Two, or I just, I need my jacket. And these, these I should say, have little RFID tags. So you'd scan that box when you put your object in it. And there's enough robots that there's gonna be one that's nearby. 
So if robots nearby are just locally looking for that jacket, one of them is going to find it quite quickly and then be able to bring it to the retrieval area. So there's no central system. The robots, you don't know where your jacket is. You don't have that information in the app or in anywhere, actually. But you can really quickly find that information. And if a human wants to come in and pick up a box and move the boxes or push a robot around, it won't matter because everything is based on the local information um, that's available. And I think a solution like this is actually closer to, to happening than, than what you might think. So some of the things we're trying with the, the arena that we built is just these toy scenarios that actually I think are not so toy. I hope I hope not uh, in the future. So this sounds a bit silly. I think we I think swarms have the potential to be there if we if we can get them get them out of the lab. But there is um, an extra caveat to that, and that is if we can make them trustworthy. So going back to the human side of it, um, as as I uh, said before, there's a lot of um, interest in this if we can get it right and, and the getting it right has to do with people thinking these swarms will work and them working because it's not just good enough for them to think it works um, and so we've been, we've just started to think about what makes a swarm safe and trustworthy and we have a new project started for three years on on this and this, this is a set of checklists of things to think about it doesn't provide solutions but at least it helps us wrap our head around what might make a swarm safe so if you have little bubble bots for example in, in, in a harbor, this is actually the Bristol Harbor, and they're meant to float around, well, you wanna make sure the individuals don't fail, that the swarm doesn't fail, that it's ethical, that it follows the regulation, that you can't hack it. Like there's just so many considerations to get this right. But if we think about it, I think, I think it's possible. So I think that's a, that's a bit of a, a whirlwind when tour of the things that we work on um, in the laboratory. It's very collaborative. Uh, across disciplines from the micro stuff to the drones um, and and it involves a lot of PhD students and postdocs and, and people from around the world as well as as funding who um, have helpfully supported some of the crazy ideas that we've put out there so thank you very much for the invitation and I'm happy to take questions now or or later yeah thank you very much it's uh, fascinating to see swarms at the, the nano level and uh, I'm glad to see that you're pursuing um, what uh, Professor Heiko Hammond calls the uh, robotics 2.0, which is uh, the brave quest of, you know, trying to take out those robots out of the lab. Mm -hmm.